or Halley. Between New York and Cali. Between who you can trust less, Giambi or Barry. Between Magic and Larry. Between Sleepless in Seattle and when Harry met Sally. If you like sports mystery, then this one should be right up your alley. And if you like sports history, then let this serve as the official tally. And as a thank you to the greatest, what a job well done. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Who's Number One. Welcome to ESPN Classics, Who's Number One? I'm Trey Wingo. You know, in this show, we're turning out the lights and saluting that thunderclap instant when gloved fist meets unprotected anatomy. The moment when the referee begins his carefully measured count. We're talking the knockout, folks. Few moments in sports evoke such strong reaction as the KO. And in the interest of strong reactions, here is our list of ESPN Classics' 20 greatest knockouts of all time. <laughs> 20. 20. On June 20th, 1960, Floyd Patterson fought Ingemar Johansson in New York's polo grounds, seeking not only to avenge the seven knockdown humiliation he suffered almost a year earlier, but to become the first heavyweight to regain the championship. For the first and only time in his career, he felt he was ready to kill. He would have done anything to, to win back that title. In the fifth round, the underdog Patterson fired a furious salvo, topped off with his patented kangaroo punch. His pride and his belt restored and reclaimed. Johansson went down, and his leg began quivering uncontrollably. Floyd was celebrating, and he turned around, and he saw that Ingemar might have been seriously hurt, and he knelt down in a gesture of compassion, and made sure that he was all right. He's just become the first man in the history of boxing to win back the heavyweight championship, something which Jack Dempsey and Joe Lewis had failed to do. And what is he concerned with the fact that he, he might have hurt or even killed this, this man? What, what have I done? That was Floyd Patterson. Floyd Patterson was not one of the greatest heavyweight champions. He might have been one of boxing's greatest gentlemen, though. Patterson and Johansson become good pals. And they do all sorts of charitable things uh, in later life and even uh, ran together in the 82 marathon. Touted as a rising star, Tommy the Duke Morrison was known for his power. On October 18, 1991, in Atlantic City, he fought another big banger, WBO heavyweight champion Ray Mercer. Ray Mercer had the two assets that alone can make you a contender punching power, and a good chin. Tommy Morrison is viewed as the up-and-coming heavyweight. One shouldn't use in a PC world great white hope, but he was. This was seen as his coming out party. That coming out party looked to be a smash hit, at least in the first three rounds. Morrison was fitting with power, he was boxing, he was doing all the things you had to do. But in the fourth round, Mercer rallied, and in the fifth, he turned merciless, unleashing a fearsome barrage. Mercer with the two good right hands. And now Mercer, on Morrison in the corner, and Mercer's all over, and Morrison in trouble! Probably the most devastating, continual knockout I have ever seen. I counted at least eight punches after Tommy had dropped his arms in surrender that hit him flush. 28 seconds in, referee Tony Perez called a halt. That image of Morrison getting knocked out slowly and brutally is one I will never, ever forget. You go into battle, you either die or you live. And I'm living. Number 18. 18. 18. Contrasting styles can make memorable fights, and so it was on May 24, 1968, in Madison Square Garden when Dick Tiger put his light heavyweight title on the line against Bob Foster. Dick Tiger was one of these impenetrable forces, strong man, uh, built close to the ground like a little brick. Bob Foster was a tall, gaunt-looking guy. He wouldn't think he could punch his way out of a paper bag, yet he had the most lethal left hook in boxing history. In the fourth round, Foster dropped his trademark bomb on Tiger. Bob Foster throws a picture book left hook that 
basically took Dick Tiger's head off. You would have thought he killed Dick Tiger. He was prone on the canvas, yet the great heart of Dickie tries to get up, but it's just not there. With that one punch, Foster not only separated Tiger from his senses, but also his belt. That was the first real hard punch you threw, wasn't it? Yeah, I was setting him up just for one good shot. The new champ would go on to successfully defend his title 14 times, 10 by knockout. Foster's career was built around that punch, and he lasted as one of the all-time great light heavyweight champions. On November 14th, 1966, Muhammad Ali, the dazzling, dancing, undefeated heavyweight champ, squared off against thunder-punching Cleveland Williams. Cleveland Williams was a guy who had a, a, a one thing going for him. He could knock out a horse if he hit it in the head. At 6'4", 210, Williams was formidable. But against the 24-year-old Ali, the challenger became a slow, plotting, easy-to-hit target. The Muhammad Ali, who was at his absolute peak, physical, mental, was in the Astrodome against Cleveland Williams. He looked like a really badass Fred Astaire. Everything was on. He landed this fusillade of blows on Cleveland Williams. Jab, punch, uppercuts, everything. Cleveland Williams' head looked like a bobblehead doll. It was just going boop, 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 boop. And he couldn't even react. Overwhelmed and defenseless, Williams was dropped three times in the second round and again in the third before Ali was finally waved off. It was the most devastating stoppage in many respects in world title fight history. When Ezard Charles defended his heavyweight title in Pittsburgh on July 18, 1951, he did so as a warrior, scarred, proud, and ever ready. He's remembered as heavyweight champion after Joe Lewis. Brilliant fighter. His punches killed a man named Sam Baruti, and there were those who claimed that Charles was never as aggressive, really, again. Charles' opponent was a man he had already beaten twice, the venerable Jersey Joe Walcott. Jersey Joe was 34, 37, or who knows how old. Probably one year shy of Social Security. As it, in fact, complained before the third fight, I get my opponents from the old man's home. Jersey Joe Walcott, he was really the black version of Jimmy Braddock, the Cinderella man. During the Depression, he couldn't get a job. And they'd call him with one week's notice to get in the ring, and he'd sometimes win and sometimes lose and go back to supporting his family. With ageless guile, nimble footwork, and devastating hooks, Walcott methodically and relentlessly assumed command of the fight. Finally, in the seventh round, he caught Charles with a short but dynamite left hook to the button. And the next thing you see is Ezra Charles lying on the ground and Jersey Joe Walcott, at some indeterminable age, is the new heavyweight champion of the world. When we return, Muhammad Ali rope dopes George Foreman in the Rumble in the Jungle, and one of the most stunning comebacks and brutal fights in boxing history, Corrales versus Castillo. Though Joe Frazier and George Foreman were both unbeaten when they fought on January 22nd, 1973, many thought this would be a one-sided affair. I had nothing but fear of Joe Frazier. I had seen what Joe Frazier could do. He was like a machine, smoking Joe Frazier. It became apparent immediately that Frazier's style was tailor-made for Foreman's strengths. Foreman had all the tools. He had a long, powerful left jab, and best of all, he had an uppercut. And Joe Frazier had no defense for that. Everybody remembers Howard's call. Down goes Frazier. Down goes Frazier! Down goes Frazier! Down goes Frazier! It's maybe the most memorable signature fight call of the past 33 years. Frazier is down again! George Foreman hit Joe Frazier so hard, Joe went up, and then he went down. It was as if he was bouncing a basketball. Frazier's knees buckled. He is about, he is down. What I remember most about that fight was that Frazier kept getting up, and I knew he would. He was going to take a beating until literally he died out there. Frazier was down six times in only four minutes and 35 seconds. 
Foreman hadn't just won the belt, he'd ripped it from Smoking Joe. Had you had a nickname at that time, it would have been George Invincible Foreman. It was unbelievable what he had done. On June 18, 1941, in New York's Polo Grounds, when Billy Kahn met Joe Lewis, the former light heavyweight champ was given little chance, and with good reason. Joe Lewis was the quintessential world's heavyweight champion. He held the title longer than anybody, almost 12 years, in fact. To lend the fight at least an appearance of competitiveness, the officials played games with the actual weights. Weights were announced for this fight at Joe Lewis, 199 and a half. Billy Kahn, 174 and a half. In point of fact, that was not what it read on the scales. It was 204 and 169. Though 35 pounds lighter, Kahn had the upset in his fists, for 12 rounds anyway. Kahn not only outboxed Lewis, but continually beat him to the punch and really began to beat him up. Goes back to his corner, Kahn does, after the 12th round. And his manager, Jake Mintz and Johnny Ray, are telling him, just take it easy. Just three more rounds, you're champion. And he says, no, I'm going to go knock him out. Well, that was his mistake. Lewis hurts Khan. And once Lewis got you hurt, there was no escape. The last punch was a right hand. Khan falls face forward. He gets up at the count of 11. And the fight was over. After the knockout, one writer says, Billy, Billy, what happened? What, you had him. What'd you do? And Billy Kahn, true to his impish self, said, what's the sense of being Irish if you can't be stupid? Number 13. On May 7th, 2005, in Las Vegas, lightweight champs Diego Corrales and Jose Luis Castillo engaged in a title unifications fight whose brutality was harsh even for a blood sport. It was also mesmerizing and altogether unforgettable. It's like watching Indianapolis 500 without ever having a pit stop. You know, the engines were going all the time. There goes a mouthpiece. You didn't know whether to love it for the competitiveness and the fight it was, or to hate it because it was just so brutal. And then to get to the 10th round, to finally bring the curtain down with that kind of twist and turn. Oh, what a left hook by Castillo! Castillo knocks Corrales down twice. Corrales is done. He's beaten up. His will has been broken. Castillo looking to finish it here. He goes down again. And then all of a sudden, a fallen warrior gets a chance while the other guy goes and takes a step back for a moment, gets a chance to get up, and actually fell him. Weak steps in, and the fight is over. Was it one of the greatest fights of all time? No doubt. The criteria were all met. Tremendous action, fast pace, big stakes, and a violent and graphic and sudden ending. Number 12. When Ali entered the ring in Kinshasa, Zaire, on October 30th, 1974, there was concern for his welfare as he met the imposing heavyweight champion, George Foreman. Foreman was undefeated. He had knocked out Joe Frazier in two rounds. He knocked out Ken Norton in two rounds. He seemed like a juggernaut, unstoppable. But Ali improvised a strategy to blunt Foreman's power, inviting him to punch himself into exhaustion. It was called rope -a well, I thought he was a dope on the rope. I swear to God, I thought he was going to get right out of there and break his neck. End of the second round, we're screaming at him in the corner. And he said, shut up. I know what I'm doing. This guy's not hurting. Just shut up. When I hit him hard in the side, I mean, I got a good shot. And he said, is that all you got, George? And I remember thinking, yep, that's about it. By the eighth round, he looked almost ready to collapse when Ali comes off the ropes and then decides to go for the knockout. Ali now taking advantage of Foreman's head was bent, and quickly a combination. All right, finally sending up Foreman down. When he took him out, it was like a pirouette. The way George went down it was probably the most graceful, most beautiful looking knockout in boxing history. It was Ali's masterpiece. 11, 11, 11, 11.
On August 2, 1980, in his hometown of Detroit, Thomas Hearns sought the WBA welterweight title held by Pepino Cuevas. Hearns' chin was suspect. Cuevas' power was not. Many people felt that once Pepino hit Tommy on that chin, it would be all over. But Hearns was every bit the hitman, needing less than two rounds. Hearns chased him around the ring, and then when Cuevas tried to move in on him, he just punched him even harder. You could see the look of incredulity on his face, that how on earth did this guy hit me that hard? Hey, Cuevas is down! All you saw was Pepino Cuevas rocking back and forth like an aspen in the wind. And then one more, and he is down. It was just an incredible knockout. You knew he wasn't getting back up. When top 20 knockouts returns, George Foreman turns back the hands of time and the final of three wars between Rocky Graziano and Tony Zale. Welcome back to Who's Number One. You know, considering the number of knockouts over the years, it's been difficult to select only 20. I mean, some bone-shaking beauties have been left out of our roll call. Here are five that just missed. After his knockout of Ray Lampkin, Roberto Duran displayed neither sympathy nor compassion. After the Ray Lampkin fight, when he was interviewed and told, you know, they took Ray to the hospital, he said, if I was in better shape, they'd take him to the morgue. Joe Frazier was at his smoking best in taking the heavyweight title from Jimmy Ellis. He knocked Ellis down twice with that left hook brutally. Angelo Dundee realized his fighter was in peril, and he pulled the plug. He was on Queer Street, didn't know he got knocked down. Forget about it. Jess Willard, billed as the Great White Hope, set off racist celebrations with his 26th round knockout of Jack Johnson. The reason he was hated was he was black. It was unforgivable for him to be black. In their WBA heavyweight title fight, John Tate spent 14 rounds destroying Mike Weaver. Unfortunately for Tate, they fought a 15th. Weaver got him on the ropes and nailed him. Tate went down, counted out. You would have thought it was the ending to Rocky Seven. Aaron Pryor's 14th round knockout of Alexis Arguello for the junior welterweight title was frighteningly brutal. Alexis was pounded to the point where you really worried that he would survive this. Ten. Number 10. Numero 10. On October 16, 1909, in Colma, California, heavyweight champ Jack Johnson and middleweight king Stanley Ketchell agreed to mute their power to fight what Johnson thought would be an exhibition. But it stopped being for fun in the 12th round. To Johnson's astonishment and fury, Ketchell's manager shouted, now, Stanley, now, and he threw a big right hand and knocked Johnson down. Johnson landed on one glove, jumped up, and hit Stanley Ketchell as hard as any human being has hit another. And the next thing you see is Stanley Ketchell lying on the canvas in a crucifixion imitation, out, while Jack Johnson is standing behind him, picking two teeth out of his gloves that don't belong to him, they belong to the fallen Ketchell. That might be the most spine-chilling knockout in the history of boxing. Number nine. <laughs> When he entered the ring in Las Vegas on November 5th, 1994, George Foreman was 20 years removed from losing the heavyweight title. And he looked every bit of that absence against the champ, Michael Moore. Through the first nine rounds, Michael Moore is just tattooing. But in the 10th round, the old man turned back time. And Michael Moore is down, goes Moore on a right hand. And all of a sudden, boom, the right hand. Bing, right behind it. And you never saw the right hand. And that's what he caught Michael Moore with, a perfect punch. It was as if Michael Moore was hit by light. One quick shot. You know, thanks for playing our game, cash and parting gifts. Johnny Olsen, tell us what he's won. The punch went through his mouth guard, ripped his mouth guard in half, and went through his lip and ripped his lip in half. You see the blood welling up behind Moore's lips. At 45. Foreman regained what he had lost at 25. When I defeated Michael Moore, it was a happy moment, by far the, the most splendid moment I've had in boxing, really. Eight. Eight. 
When Rocky Graziano and Tony Zale met for the middleweight title, they'd already traded the crown in two bouts that had entered into boxing legend. These were what fight writers call wars. Well, they're not war, but that's about as close as you can get to war without ever having a war, Zale and Graziano. They fight a third time in 1948 in Newark, New Jersey. This time, Graziano goes in as the champion. And this time, Zale comes out as the champion. In the first round, Zale floored Graziano. And just as the bell rang, Zale let fly a right to the heart, which landed after the bell rang. Zale with a left hook from hell in that third round. All I can say is almost beheads Graziano, who goes down in different parts. Rocky went down and was out. It was the end of the greatest, perhaps, three-bout series of all time. Top 20 Knockouts continues with arguably the greatest round in boxing history between a Cobra and a man named Marvelous. The Hagler Heard Street Fight is next. Buster Douglas, a 42 to 1 underdog, was supposed to be just another appetizer for heavyweight champ Mike Tyson when they met in February of 1990 in Tokyo. He didn't have the discipline, he didn't have the mental toughness, or if you want to just be really crude, he didn't have the heart. But for one enchanted evening, Douglas was all he'd never been. Buster Douglas looked like a top 10 all time heavyweight. On that particular night, he made magic. I was in the zone, man. I was in that zone, that zone. In the eighth round of that fight, with Douglas ahead on points, he gets hit. There's a perfect opportunity for him to just lose it all. Nobody would have blamed him at that point. And there's a right hand uppercut, and down goes Douglas. It was a good shot. It knocked me down. But I was still focused, and I picked the count up. Then I got up, went right back to work, started punching again, letting them hands go. He showed you that, yeah, he did come to win this fight. He did come to right some wrongs of his past. In the 10th round, Douglas put the finishing touches on one of the sport's most memorable upsets. The knockout sequence that Douglas lays on Mike Tyson is one of the best combinations that I've ever seen in boxing. Oh, the uppercut. What an uppercut by Douglas. Tyson. Down goes Tyson. We just seen a shot, you know, pivoting. You know, and then I was able to finish him. The scene that sticks in my mind, Tyson is on his knee. He's got gloves on. He's trying to pick up his mouthpiece and stick it in his mouth, which is like trying to pick a glob of mercury off a kitchen table while wearing catcher's gloves. No way. With his stunning knockout, Douglas not only took the title from Tyson, he stripped away Iron Mike's aura of invincibility. Just keep chopping on him. Just keep chopping on him. And eventually, he's going to go. And that's what happened. As you've seen over there, he was flat on his ass. <laughs> in their first fight earlier in 1955, Carmen Basilio ended a violent and epic bout with a knockout of Tony DeMarco at 152 of the 12th. The rematch on November 30th in Boston Garden turned out to be deja vu all over again. It is, in many ways, a duplication of the first fight because DeMarco just tees off. He is rocking Carmen. As in the first fight, Basilio found a reservoir of energy in the eighth round and rallied. Carmen just came on and again wore him down. It seemed Basilio had this residue of energy and pure gumption, which was bottomless. By the 12th round, again, DeMarco is winded, wasted, and over. Carmen knocks him down. Tony was up at seven. Fair game. Carmen was on him again. Tony went down again, and the referee, Mel Manning, didn't even bother to count. Out. This fight, one minute and 54 seconds of the 12th round. Two seconds longer than the first fight. 
Same result, who said lightning never strikes twice in the same spot. Five. Five. When Thomas Hitman Hearns met marvelous Marvin Hagler on April 15th, 1985 in Las Vegas, each was after more than the middleweight title. Hearns wanted to come back from that famous loss to Sugar Ray Leonard late in the fight. And Hagler wanted uh, public approval. He wanted uh, his, his recognition. And they both clearly were not gonna quit until one of them couldn't get up off the canvas. Hearns had made a decision to go toe to toe with Hagler and, and fight him uh, in, in an all out slugfest. Hagler was surprised that he took this tack. He caught on pretty fast. It was the greatest first round I ever saw in my life from flyweights to heavyweights to guys fighting in bars, Hagler Hearns. Just when you thought that Hearns didn't have a chance, he was just getting caught, he came back with his savage punches, rocked Hagler back, Hagler stopped his attack and started to cover up, and all of a sudden you said, whoa, whoa, wait a minute, this could go the other way. More power punches are thrown in that round than I have ever seen in my life, I mean, connecting. I mean, it's bam, slam, wham, bam. But it had been fought at a terrible cost. Hearn's right hand was broken, and Hagler was bleeding from a gash on his forehead. Hagler never lets up, uh, probably with the knowledge that they're going to stop the fight if this goes on. He's going to lose his title that he's fought so hard to get on cuts. The referee called time to check those cuts in the third round. And Hagler responded with a fury. The final combination is absolutely spectacular. He hits him, hits him again, hits him again. Tommy didn't have anything left. Once he got hit by Hagler, he was gone. He wasn't just knocked out, he was gone. Hagler retained his title, and boxing had an eight-minute classic for its archives. It was a spectacular fight. I don't think you'll see any great fight in the last 30, 40 years that has much action in three rounds. Still ahead, three legendary champs give three legendary beatings, including a fight that many consider the most important sporting event of the 20th century. It's New Year's. On May 1st, 1957, in Chicago, when Sugar Ray Robinson fought to regain the middleweight title from Gene Fulmer, it was a textbook example of boxer versus brawler. If I asked God to create the perfect fighter, it would be Ray Robinson. He could box, he could punch, he had magnificent defensive skills, he could take a punch, he could win over a long period of time. He had every criteria that a great fighter has to have. Gene Fulmer, on the other hand, was a caveman. He would hold you with his left hand and hit you with his right. He would perhaps accidentally hit you with his knee. He was a tough guy. The first four rounds of the rematch were a replay of the first bout, Fulmer doing what he pleased. Fulmer's doing the same exact thing that took him to victory in their first fight. Mauling, brawling, jumping in, jumping out. I mean, there's no style. It's a lack of style, but it's a winning lack of style. But in the fifth, Robinson nailed Fulmer with a punch as sweet as, well, sugar. In 75 years of boxing, that was the best left hook they figured it was ever thrown, and it happened to catch me on the chin. The next thing you see is Gene Fulmer on the ground, looking as if he's trying to take his glove off the ground, which has been epoxied to the canvas, and hits over. The only thing I remember is Robinson jumping up and down, and I was wondering how come he was doing exercise between rounds, and when my manager told me they'd counted 10, and I knew I hadn't heard any of it, I knew who it was on. <laughs> At 35, Robinson had won the middleweight title for a record fourth time. This was the last great moment of Ray Robinson's career. But this one punch was one of the great punches in the history of boxing. Three. Three. In his rematch with Max Schmeling on June 22, 1938, with more than 70,000 crammed into Yankee Stadium, Joe Lewis brought into the ring with him 
with a weight of unimaginable pressure and expectation. Joe Lewis had lost to Max Schmeling earlier in his career, um, so there was a revenge motive in the fight, but even bigger than the revenge motive was the free world versus the fascist world element. He becomes the guy who's fighting for America, who's fighting for democracy, who's fighting against Hitler and, and a theory of a master race and extermination of the Jews. He wants this guy again. He wants this guy again more than he wants anything in his life, before or since. Schmeling thought Lewis was going to come out at him and attempt a counterpunch. Instead, Lewis went out there and jumped on him. He hits Schmeling with a left hook that makes him scream. He's all over him. He broke his ribs. It was a nightmare for Schmeling. A right to the body, a left hook, a right to the head, a left to the head. And he's against the ropes, and Lewis unloaded. He was merciless in that fight. Schmeling is almost helpless. Right to the body, a left hook to the jaw, and Schmeling is down. The fight is over on a technical knockout. At two minutes and four seconds of round one, referee Art Donovan stopped it. Lewis had avenged his defeat with a victory whose impact extended far beyond boxing. Joe Lewis, by knocking out Schmeling in the rematch, that is the most symbolic sports event in history. That was democracy versus fascism. That was the dress rehearsal for World War II. There was celebration in the streets everywhere because this was not just Lewis beating Schmeling, this was Roosevelt beating Hitler. In the 1920s, known as the golden age of sport, giants walked the land. Babe Ruth, Bobby Jones, Bill Tilden, but perhaps none bigger than heavyweight champ Jack Dempsey. He was truly like a, like a wild jungle beast. I mean, it was, it was hard to describe the excitement that uh, Dempsey engendered in the fan. Jack Dempsey was the Mike Tyson of his era. He had this ferocity. He had this um, killer instinct. Dempsey was served up a small mountain known as the Wild Bull of the Pampas. Louis Angel Furpo, this towering, walking Andes from Argentina, undefeated, but totally unschooled. He was like a Neanderthal fighting on steroids. A, a monstrous looking guy would intimidate you just by stepping into the ring. So they put the fight on September 14, 1923 at the Polo Grounds. Jack came out, Verpo came out, flash knocked out of Dempsey, up immediately. And Dempsey then waded in, wham, down goes Verpo. 20 seconds into the fight, you've had two knockdowns. Then after that, all hell breaks loose. Chaos reigns. There's knockdown two, knockdown three, knockdown four, knockdown five, knockdown six, and knockdown seven of Verpo. And each time he's knocked down, Dempsey stands over him like an avenging angel of death until his gloves leave the canvas and beats him back down again. In the midst of receiving all that cannon fire, Furpo summoned an attack. Furpo landed a hard punch and Dempsey went through the ropes. His whole body goes through the top two strands of rope like a letter going through a mail chute. Press lifts Dempsey back in, Furpo spends the last 30 seconds or so swinging at Dempsey. The crowd is on its feet. They have seen the greatest first round in boxing history. All told, Furpo's down seven times in the first round. Dempsey's been down twice, and we have 14 long rounds to go. Come out second round, Dempsey comes right at Furpo. Bam, puts him down, and miraculously, Furpo gets up. And Bam, puts him down, and Furpo is still trying to get up when he's counted out by the referee galley. Furbo lifted one leg when he was unconscious, like a wounded steer. Boy, talk about drama. 11 knockdowns in 227 seconds. The greatest fight in history, period, end of paragraph. It's been called the greatest right hand ever thrown. We'll tell you who threw it and why it's our number one knockout of all time. Welcome back to Who's Number One and the Greatest Knockouts of All Time. Let's recap what we've seen so far. Ingemar Johansson, Floyd Patterson, two. Ray Mercer, Tommy Morrison. Bob Foster, Dick Tiger. 
Muhammad Ali, Cleveland Williams. Jersey Joe Walcott, Ezard Charles III. George Foreman, Joe Frazier. Joe Lewis, Billy Kahn. Diego Corrales, Jose Luis Castillo. Muhammad Ali, George Foreman. Thomas Hearns, Pepino Cuevas. Jack Johnson, Stanley Ketchell. George Foreman, Michael Moore. Tony Zale, Rocky Graziano III. Buster Douglas, Mike Tyson. Carmen Basilio, Tony DeMarco II. Marvin Hagler, Thomas Hearns. Sugar Ray Robinson, Gene Fulmer II. Joe Lewis, Max Schmeling II. Jack Dempsey, Luis Furpo. Well, of all the heavy artillery we've rolled out, here is the hit that ranks first. The number one greatest KO of all time. Duck and cover. Number one. One. Jersey Joe Walcott was everybody's sentimental favorite. Uh, he was a gentleman. He was a terrific fighter. He had had a really rough career, come off welfare. No one knew really how old he was. Finally wins the heavyweight championship. And he has to fight probably the most invincible fighter of his time, Rocky Marciano who was just a, a devastating little block of a man. He would be the physical metaphor for the irresistible force. He just kept coming and throwing that dreadful overhand right that just hammered everybody into submission. But having survived so much, Jersey Joe Walcott wasn't easily impressed. Before fighting Rocky Marciano on September 23rd, 1952, in Philadelphia, he was defiantly confident. Walcott said, if I don't beat uh, Marciano, take my name out of the record books. Walcott came right at Marciano, throwing left hooks, and caught him with several of them, knocking him down for the first time in his career. You can see Marciano's instant reaction when he gets up. Uh, he's not stunned. Walcott is smart enough to realize he doesn't have him hurt. And there's sort of a resignation hits Walcott that he's in for a very grueling fight. But between the sixth and seventh rounds, a solvent used to treat cuts seeped into Marciano's eyes. He was blinded. He couldn't see at all. I had never seen him get pushed around the way he was. He was getting beat up. Finally, in about the ninth round, his eyes start clearing. He's back in the fight. And now, Walcott, thinking he's got the fight in the bag, goes to his shuffle. I'll pop him here and move away. And it's working. Going into the 13th round, Walcott was comfortably ahead, and a battered Marciano looked to be wobbling to his first defeat. Or so it seemed. They come together, and they each throw right hands at the same time. Marciano, who throws nothing but blockbusters, as per his name, throws a shorter right, and it catches Walcott. You look at Walcott's head, there's, there's a terrible distortion. Everything just crunched uh, together. And Marciano looks around to see that the ref isn't quite in view and adds a little left hook to send him on his way. The Marciano right hand that knocked out Walcott was probably the best right hand ever thrown. When the referee counts Joe Walcott out, you almost want to scream, forget it, just call the medics. Call the doctor in there now. Don't wait 10 seconds. He can count all day. 10, 10,000, 10 million, doesn't matter. He is out. It's the most devastating one punch in the history of boxing. Well, we've seen 20 pugilists knocked out, and now it's time for our rankings to be ranked. And for that, we turn to our second guessers, the ringside duo of Brian Kenny and Burt Sugar. Gentlemen, no low blows. All right, Brian Kenny, Burt Randolph, Sugar here at Gleason's Gym in Brooklyn. Let's talk about this, Burt. First, this is largely your list. Explain your criteria. Important fight, championship almost without exception, 
an ebb and flow, the one punch or two punches, changed the whole course of the fight. I think that I tried to put him in historical perspective today, yesterday, and there's one unstated element. They gotta be showable. Mm -hmm. I don't wanna do Goliath and David. Great, mm -hmm. great knockout. Mm -hmm. Great upset. Is that yeah. on your upset list? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, all right. So, uh, you know, and I was there. Yeah, there was, uh, <laughs> yes, I heard about that. I mean, we were splitting hairs here, but I, let's go over the list a little bit. At number 13, you have Corrales Castillo. And I don't, how is it that low? I mean, not that it's low, it's in your top 25, but yeah. why is it number 13? I mean, well, it's a lightweight championship fight. You have one guy going down twice in the same round. He comes back and beats the other guy for the lightweight title. I find it one of the great knockouts of all time. 13, I'm not superstitious. All we're doing is talking the degree of a great knockout, not the species. I identify it as such. But I'm trying to put him in perspective as a total history of the sport, not just the last five years. But you know what? But you st that's still part of the history. Even though it's recent I, history, you have to be able to place it in perspective. Do you think it'll move up through the years? On some people's list, it might go down. <laughs> it, it, would it surprise you if it went down um, as I well? I tell you, no, it would, no, it would stun me. It, it, because it shouldn't. Because you have, for, it's for the lightweight championship, it was after nine brutal rounds, and then in the, the ultimate round, nothing's ever been better. That was and a you, great round. And I know you love Dempsey versus Firpo, but Firpo was not competitive in that fight. You had that number two, Bert. I know Dempsey's a towering figure in the sport, but that fight was not competitive. Firpo knocked him down with the first punch. He pushed him out of the ring, Bert. That was the second knockdown. What was the, where's the first one? The Missing. First, no, on our films, yes, in America. Dempsey had it cut out. On the films you'll see in South America, and I've seen it, and it's in some libraries, unfortunately not yours, he knocks him down, Firpo does, with the first punch. That's competitive. C according to you. I don't know if that's, if, I've never seen it. Emmis, I, no one's ever Emmis, seen it. Emmis, you're, you're, Emmis, you're it's part of it's the possible. lore of boxing. That I, I think that's it. I think it's part of the lore of boxing. And that's it. Her too. Now, the, the, now, Mike Tyson makes your list in a loss. You can't find a Mike Tyson knockout. There were so many great knockouts, and some of them were very significant. I mean, Marvis Frazier was not, but Mike Tyson knocking out Michael Spinks was for the heavyweight title. Spinks was kind of a linear heavyweight champion at that point. I just didn't find it to be as the same significant say as, would you put it ahead of Corrales and Castillo? No, I wouldn't, because okay. I'd have yeah. Corrales Castillo. I'd have Corrales Castillo number two. That's why. So, so you I would agree with my number one. Uh, yeah, number one is good. Rocky Marciano is fine. He's, he stays Joe at number Walcott. one. Yeah, uh, they, he stays at number one. Well, Dempsey Perpo go, leave, leave completely. <laughs> you agree so with something. No, no Tyson on this list as far as you know, as far as devastation, as far as complete dominance. I didn't and see an Evan division. flow where he did something against Trevor Burbick. That was an Evan flow. The, uh, he knocked out two men that night. You want to have him in against the photographer from Swords Illustrated? Yeah, you know, yeah, but Burbick uh, yeah, bouncing yeah, around. Yeah, yeah, Burbick, how about Larry down. Holmes? I know it's an older Larry Holmes. That too was that exhilarating. Didn't, that didn't have the significance. Yeah, well, yeah, Tyson didn't climb off the canvas to knock people out. No. He just he, drilled them before they had a chance to hurt him. And you're I holding also that don't have a two 11-second knockouts in their preliminary fighters. Lorenzo Kennedy is not on your <laughs> list at all. <laughs> Jerry Cooney, uh, Ken Norton. That's, I, I know it's, you know, Cooney was not heavyweight champion, never became one. Devastating, but still, yes, yeah. but Norton, that was his last fight. Why? Because he was over the hill, yes. Okay. Lewis Rockman. Both of them. Either one. Pick one. And I like the second one better. And then both times the title changed hands, both times for the heavyweight title. You talk about being aesthetically pleasing. That second one was a beautiful right hand from Lennox Lewis. Oh, it was. Over a man who was doing this. I, mean, I don't He's the heavyweight champion of the world. He's holding his arms out because he's ready to get knocked out. He's, he's no, hoping no, he doesn't get knocked out. he was out. incompetent. Well, no, he's the heavyweight yeah. champion of the world, though. And actually, he was a top ten heavyweight for a long time, Rockman. I just didn't find that to have any of the juice that these others have. And would you put it ahead of your Castillo and Corrales? No, because Castillo Corrales would be number two, Bert. That's why. <laughs> Only Rocky Marciano would I put ahead of Castillo Corrales. All right, Bert. I'm going to work my list, all right? All we'll right. do it another time. You've been working me <laughs> over pretty well. Now that the second guessers have had their say, it's now time to see how you, the fan, voted on SportsNation on ESPN.com. Number five, George Foreman dismantling Joe Frazier. Number four, Joe Lewis pummeling Matt Schmeling in round one of their historic rematch. Number three, Buster Douglas knocking out Mike Tyson in 1990. Number two, with 48.9% of the vote, Rocky Marciano over Jersey Joe Walcott. And number one by the closest margin in who's number one history, with 49.8% of the vote, Muhammad Ali knocking out big George Foreman in the Rumble in the Jungle. So that's it for this edition of ESPN Classics, who's number one. I'm Trey Wingo, and thanks for joining us for the ranking of the 20 greatest knockouts of all time. Rest assured, we will be back to continue our countdown of the teams, the athletes, and the events that have shaped our world of sports. Until then, let the debating begin. <laughs>